All right, we welcome you to Believers in Christ Fellowship. Coming to you live streaming from Smithville, Texas. And um, we're uh, blessed that we're going to be able to study the Word of God again tonight. We're studying the Minor Prophets, and we've been studying in the book of Joel for the past couple of weeks, and we're going to continue tonight in chapter 2. We're going to be going through uh, chapter 2, verse 20, down through verse 27. So Joel is a very interesting book. It's only three chapters long, but there's a lot of information in there and that uh, the prophecy that God gave to uh, Joel to give to his people. And so um, I think it's a very interesting lesson. We did not have a study last Wednesday, but we will have one tonight. And then uh, next Monday, Wednesday, we will continue on with chapter 2 and then get into chapter 3 as well. I want to go ahead and begin reading with chapter 2 of Joel, verse 20, and we'll go down through verse 27. It said, But I will remove far from off far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part towards the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. So I want to go back and uh, go with the start with verse 20. He said, I will remove far off from you the northern army. And will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the uttermost, utmost sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. We're talking about deliverance is going to follow repentance. And the whole concept of what Joel is trying to tell us is, if Israel repents, then God will deliver them. Same thing is true today. If we repent of our sins, repent of what's going on, what we've done wrong, God will deliver us from situations that we could get ourselves into, some problem, areas of trouble or problems or such. And so in verse 19 that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the Lord was speaking about the reproach that was suffered by the people of God. Why? Because they allowed themselves to be influenced by the heathen nations around them. And when they did that, the heathen nations actually mocked Israel because they felt like they did not, that Israel did not have a God strong enough to support them or to deliver them, and they re, there was a reproach to Israel. In other words, they were living in shame, just like we do if we've done things wrong. And you know, you know how it is when you're a Christian, you're supposed to be perfect. Well, I've got news for the world out there, the unbelievers. A Christian is not perfect. But a person can be, a Christian can be righteous in the eyes of God. Therefore, when we do things that we know are not supposed to be done, we do things wrong and an unbeliever sees it, I'm talking about an outward thing, we've done something wrong. If the unbeliever sees it, they will make you ashamed of it. They will come and they will say something, well, I thought you were a Christian. You know, we've had situations like that in situations with the, uh, the business that we have. And I know one time, <laughs> It's happened more than once, but this one particular time a uh, situation arose and we had to charge someone something for a service that was being done. And the man made a comment to my husband. He said, well, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you weren't supposed to charge me. He said, look, I'm a Christian, but I have to eat. You know, just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I can't be a business person and do what's proper. You don't, you know, do things wrong. You do things in fairness with people. Amen but you do it in the proper way and the appropriate way. But because you're a Christian, they do look at you and they'll look at anything to, to, try, to, try, to try to downgrade you and to try to say that you're not being a Christian. So we have to be careful of that. But in the case of Israel, they actually were going according to the heathenistic practices. 
they were letting the heathen paganistic uh, influences come into their society. God told them years and years and years and years before that, don't do that. When you go in to kill the enemy, kill all the enemy so that they won't come in. And it's not like he's wanting to kill everybody because he's evil. He's trying to tell Israel, you kill the enemy so they won't come in and influence you and infiltrate into your society, into your culture. Amen? Same thing with today. You don't let evil come into your church and try to infiltrate into your church. And when I say evil, I'm talking about false doctrine. I'm talking about people who are living in sin. I'm talking about things that are going down. I don't know. We, all of us do things we shouldn't do from time to time probably. I understand that. But I'm talking about someone who's blatantly coming in and trying to take over or be a part of your services when they are living in sin or when they're doing things they shouldn't be doing. Okay? So it would be the same thing with Israel, what Israel was going through. But... Israel had been involved with idolatry and pagan worship during her past history. So that prediction that Joel is giving now, talking about what's going to happen 250 years in the future with Babylon, should not be a surprise to us because Israel had been doing that same thing for a long time anyway. Amen? So he wasn't telling them anything new. They already understood. They were already involved in the idolatry, the pagan practices. But he was letting them know what was going to happen if they continued in that. He was trying to give them a heads up warning on that. What would happen? Now what would have happened if Israel had repented? If Israel had repented when Joel preached this and told them this prophecy? They would not have had the judgment. They would not have had 70 years of Babylonian exile. They would not have had Judah completely destroyed. So all of those things add up. And it's the same thing today. The Holy Spirit tells us in Isaiah 66, 2 of how we, should, um, how we should react and what God expects of us. Isaiah 66, verse 2. It says, For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But... To the man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. In other words, what he's looking at is a humble heart, the contrite heart. And anything that happens, if a person is humble and contrite in their spirit, God will forgive them and he will, uh, anyone who repents of their evil ways will be forgiven. The Lord said he would forgive anyone no matter how many times they ask. Amen? But they have to ask. He looks at those who have a contrite, humble heart and who fear and respect his word. You know, during the seven years of tribulation, Israel is going to continue to suffer reproach until she accepts the Lord of the second coming. She hasn't learned that lesson quite yet. And she will learn that lesson during that tribulation period of time as the Lord comes and she will accept him. And why is she going to accept him? And when is she going to accept him? When she realizes she cannot do it on her own. That's when we have to pretty much get down to the, um, what would you say, nitty-gritty of it. You have to kind of let yourself, you have to be completely desolate. Pretty much rock bottom. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to think of. You have to hit rock bottom a lot of times. A lot of us do. Not everybody, but a lot of us have to hit rock bottom before we realize, hey, you know what? I can't do this on my own. I have to let God help me. And Israel is going to be in that situation where she's going to have to understand the only one that can help her is God. So at that time, during that battle of Armageddon, this prophecy is going to be totally fulfilled. Isaiah, I mean, uh, Israel will come to the Lord and they will repent of their sins. It's going to be carried out. The Antichrist is going to be defeated. I want us to look at Ezekiel chapter 38 Ezekiel chapter 38 verses 15 and 16 it says and thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts thou and many people with thee all of them riding upon horses a great company and a mighty army and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, O Gog, before their eyes. In other words, this is talking about the Antichrist is coming from the north. When Nebuchadnezzar came in and, and um, captured Jerusalem, he came from the north. Now, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. 
and who the Antichrist is going to be, I feel like he's going to be a Syrian Jew because, number one, he's going to have to be a Jew. Otherwise, the Jewish people would not accept him. He most likely, all indicate, a lot of indications are that he probably will come from the Syria area. If that's the case, he's going to be coming in from the north, the same way that Nebuchadnezzar came in to Israel to capture Israel, Jerusalem. So that's what Ezekiel was talking about there and talking about how the army is coming in from the north. Now, the East Sea is, is the Dead Sea. So you have to look at it and see the East Sea. When he, when he comes down from the north, he's going to be coming in west of the Dead Sea because the East Sea would be the Dead Sea. It's going to be on his east side, okay? The Hinder Sea, or Hinder Sea, whatever you want to call it, is most likely considered the Mediterranean Sea, which is the sea that Israel is on. That's what they are, they're bordered on. So... Um, a lot of scholars, or I should say some scholars, feel like Joel was prophesying about the same time as Jeremiah. But um, I believe, and from what I'm reading and from what I'm studying, that he prophesied probably about 250 years before Jeremiah did. But whatever the case may be, this is speaking of the Antichrist during the Great Tribulation. And he know, we know that he'll be totally defeated and destroyed. <clears throat> He's going to come into Israel from the north, the exact same way that Nebuchadnezzar entered Israel. The phrase that says, his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up, refers to the large army that the Antichrist will have and they will be killed. So if you skip all over to Ezekiel 39, verses 11 through 16, chapter 39, verse 11 through 16, It says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude. And they shall call it the valley of Hamongog, which is the same as Armageddon. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land. For seven months it's going to take that long for them to bury their dead. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown. The, it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. And they shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search, and the passengers that pass through the land, when they any seeth a man's bone. Then shall he set up a sign by it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. And also the name of the city shall be Hamanah. Thus shall they cleanse the land. He's talking about all the people who are going to be killed during that battle of Armageddon. And it's going to take about seven months for them to be, for to them to be buried. And so it's going to be, can you imagine the stink? After seven months of having people laying out there who have been killed. How many have heard the news what happened yesterday? They found that truck just right close to uh, Lackland Air Force Base. And they're saying now so far 51 people have been killed. That's a slow death to suffocate. But here's the thing. They caught the driver, and he was high on meth. But anyway, I think what tipped the people off, people had gone by there and smelled it. I don't know how many bodies were in the truck, but 51 at least died. And you can imagine the smell that was from coming from that truck. And there were 16 more that went to the hospital. Yeah, and one little boy was in serious, serious condition. But I'm talking about the ones that died. They were smuggled in. And what I'm getting at is this. You could smell the smell. And what they were saying was, I don't know who it was, but somebody went in there and sprinkled meat seasoning on top of them to make them smell better. We're talking about 50 so people dead. Can you imagine what the stink is going to be like during the Battle of Armageddon with that many people laid out that have died? I mean, we can't even imagine things like that. And I know when you have wars such as that, you think back and all the wars that we've had, 
people have been killed and they're laying out there in the hot sun or in the cold, whichever the case may be, and they eventually, eventually begin to, you know, deteriorate very quickly sometimes, and they smell very bad. So they're talking about the stench that's going up, and that's what he's talking about here. He talks about the Antichrist will do great things. Let me tell you something. He may think he can do some great things, but Jesus Christ can do more great things. We're going to turn to Revelation 19, verse 19. Revelation 19, 19. And see what great things that the Lord can do. Amen. Verse 19, 19 says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. In other words, he was going to be strong. He was, Jesus is going to come in. He's got an army with him. And he's going to be, um, be the great things. The great things of the Antichrist are going to be proved to be nothing. Like I said a while ago, if Israel had repented, she would have avoided all this. The same thing that's true today. The interesting thing about it is when, when Israel does repent, and this is something that people don't really think a lot about, I guess, but when Israel does repent and she becomes a premier nation that God intended for her to be all along, do you know the rest of the world is going to benefit from that? Oh, yeah. When Jesus is ruling from the throne in Jerusalem for the thousand-year reign and Israel would have already repented, then we're going to see the whole earth is going to be in peace. It's going to be different. It's going to be, it's going to be prosperous. It's going to be peaceful. And you say, well, if that's the case, then how is it that at the end of the thousand-year period of time, God is going to allow Satan to be released, and he's going to come, and he's going to still sway some people to go. I mean, all I can tell you is people have that human nature in them. And the people who are not glorified during that 1,000-year period, that reign, when God allows Satan to be released and he allows him to come back for a period of time, for a short time, we don't know how long that's going to be. There are going to be some people there who still exhibit the sinful nature and they will turn to him. It's hard for us to understand that because if you're living in peace and everything is prosperous and everything is good, why would you want to turn to somebody bad? Why would you not accept the Lord? But there is human nature. It's been there from the very beginning. God has not done away with the, with, this, with the human sinful nature. What he can do is he can come in and change you, like Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he can change your nature. But that human sinful nature is still always present in the world, amen? Until the end of time, after that thousand year reign, it'll be different. Okay, let's go back to see verses 21 and 22. Verses 21 and 22 says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. In verses 21 through 27, we're told that what God will do for Israel at the beginning of the kingdom age. That's going to be immediately after Israel's repentance, after the second coming of the Lord. And uh, that's going to last for a thousand years. When you say millennial reign or millennium age or the kingdom age, they're all the same thing. They all refer to the 1,000 year period of time. I think it's interesting that we study the word of God that the church looks at the blessings of God in the past on his people. And we look at the prophecy, what God is going to do in the future. We figure that's great. God is going to do some great things in the future. And God has blessed his people in the past. He's blessed Israel in the past. He's blessed the church in the past. He's blessed us. And he's going to bless us in the future. But how about today? He's blessing us today. Yes. He's blessing us today in this present time. We oftentimes overlook that. He has promised us blessings and he's promised us deliverance for things that are happening even today. So it's not always in the distant past. And Paul encourages us a lot to accept the grace of God now. Don't look back, but look to the, to the grace of God now. So I want us to turn to 2 Corinthians 6, verse, chapter 6, verse 2. And then we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. It said, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, 
and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Behold, and behold, now it has to be, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And then turn over to Hebrews chapter 3. And we'll do 7 and 8. Chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. It said, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. And then skip down to verse 12. He said, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart and unbelief in departing from the living God. And then skip down to verse 19. It says, So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief. So it's talking about that we need to be thankful for what we have today. Don't keep looking back. Don't always look to the future. Understand God is the God of now. The God of now. So it's so true that when we trust in God and not for the things of the world, he's going to do great things for us today. Amen. And praise the Lord for that. We have the opportunity to claim God's promises if we want something great. But the, here's the secret. You have to ask for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. During the time of the millennial reign, when Jesus is ruling in person from Jerusalem, the world as we know it will be completely changed. You know, I mentioned this before, but when, when uh, Jesus walked the earth, for that 33 and a half years, there was no historical record, no indication of war when he was here. Now, he had the... Pharisees were against him, but I'm talking about an out-and-out -out war between nations. When he was born, the wars stopped, and there were no wars on this earth for 33 and a half years. Then they crucified him, and we've had wars ever since then again. That ought to tell us something, that when he comes, it's going to be peaceful, amen? It's going to be something completely different. It's going to be prosperous. It's going to be peaceful. We're not going to understand in Romans chapter 8, verse 22, Paul talks about the earth. And you know, we talk about people being blessed. But look what it said in chapter 8, of verse 22 of, of Romans. It says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Do you know the earth is groaning? The earth is wanting something better. You know, in the Garden of Eden, think about it. It didn't rain, but they had moisture come up from the ground, and it was perfectly green. It was fertile. Um, vegetables grew. They, didn't, they did not eat meat back then. They were not carnivorous. They were vegetarians. And, but all the vegetation was, was beautiful. It was fertile, you know. And we have a hard time understanding. No worms, no bugs, no grasshoppers, <laughs> nothing that would came in that would, that would do anything. It was a perfectly fertile, perfectly beautiful garden. And the earth is groaning to go back to that same thing again. You know, we're trying to plant a garden out back of our house, and I can tell you what those things look like after about three days of no rain. <laughs> May not make it. <laughs> the earth is wanting the Lord to come back. Not just the people, but the earth. It's going to be complete. So we have a hard time understanding that. We have a hard time believing that because we're going by what we see now. You know, you've seen pictures of beautiful, beautiful areas on this world, on this earth, that are lush and green and just beautiful. But they've got snakes. They've got bugs. They've got things like that. What I'm telling you is none of that's going to be present when that happens during the millennial reign. It's going to be different. It's going to be something that we're going to be so, so happy with. Think about this. There will no longer be storms, earthquakes, floods, tornadoes, famines, or droughts. The world will be free of pollution, crime, sickness, and poverty. There will no longer be a shortage of food. There will be an abundance of food. You think we're having a shortage of food now? Just hang on. The trees, the field, and all vegetation will produce abundant crops. Every acre on the earth will be fertile because of the presence of the Lord. Every acre. Another great blessing is going to be that the beasts of the field will no longer have their wild 
carnivorous nature because the, earth, the curse will have been lifted. Isaiah prophesies a perfect utopia. And I want us to read this. It's very interesting. People need to understand what God has promised us for the future. It's going to be Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. And then we'll skip over to chapter 25, 65. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 through 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Can you imagine that? And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. You've never seen that before. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. And what an asp is, it's kind of like a, an, a snake. So you know where they, how they dig down the ground, they come back up. A child will be able to play around that. And I just, you know, I remember my daughter, she loves animals. And she was always going out to pick something up. And I said, Rebecca, don't pick that up. <laughs> That thing will hurt you. Oh, it's not going to hurt me, she said. I love every, I love animals. I'm not going to pick it. I'm not going to get hurt. That girl never got hurt by anything. Never got stung, never got hurt. God protected her. But what I'm trying to tell you is, in the, end, in the millennial reign, it's going to be like that with everybody. Amen? Pastor, what is a cockatrice? That's like I said, it's one of like the, the, uh, like the, um, the reptile type thing. I think that's what the same thing there. <clears throat> They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And then skip over to Isaiah chapter 65, verse 25. Once again, he repeats it. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Unquote. Now, I want us to understand something. He didn't say he was going to take the snakes away. <laughs> what he said was he's going to have everything tame. Because of the curse that God has put on the earth, the animals are carnivorous, they're ferocious. Like I said a while ago, when you study about um, in the beginning, before the flood, before, you know, well, when you look at, when you look at Noah and study about what they ate, it's very interesting when we went to the ark, in the Creation Museum, they were showing the things that Noah and his family ate. All the animals they had on the ark, and they didn't eat any of them. They were vegetarian. And people say, well, how did they get the zebra on there? How did they get the, the little lion? And you have to, first of all, you have to understand, he got the infants, the baby animals, not huge giant elephants and all, okay? And some of those animals were a little bit different than what they look like today. But they got a male and a female babies of each thing. And that was the pair. And so what happened on there, with all the animals that they had, they did not eat any of that. And none of the animals were carnivorous. They did not come and try to bite any of the men or anything like that. The, men, the people were vegetarians. You see, it was completely different. But after the flood, things changed. They had dinosaurs. They had baby dinosaurs on the ark. It's very interesting to study that. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm not going to go into it right now. I don't have the time. Uh, I have a whole study on Genesis I'd like to do sometime maybe in, in, uh, to talk about that. But there are words in the Bible that describe dinosaurs, that talk about dinosaurs. So people who like to study about dinosaurs, it's very interesting. You need to study the Old Testament. But the main thing I'm trying to get across to you is that when that curse is lifted, even the animals will be, you know, friendly to you. Nothing's going to be harming you. Nothing's going to be hurting you anymore. It's going to be completely good and completely prosperous. Amen. Okay, let's go back to Joel with verse 23. It said, Be glad, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The nations of the world are blessed when Israel is obedient to the Lord, like we said a while ago. So 
in this verse 23, we see that Israel will be restored as the premier nation of the world when she accepts Jesus as her Messiah. And she will resume her rightful place in the government and in the world the way God had intended to be all along. From the beginning of time, even today, Gentile nations do not understand the role that Israel plays in the plans of God. Therefore, the Gentile nations do not understand that we have power sometimes only because Israel for so long has forfeited her position by rebelling against God. Now, I want to say that again. A lot of times the United States thinks that we're so good and holy and great. That's not the reason God has given us the power and given us the means to do certain things. The only reason is is because Israel has forfeited her right to be in that rightful position that she's supposed to be in. Therefore, God is allowing, and that's what we need to understand, allowing the United States to be a leader in some ways. And um, without getting into politics, I can hate to tell you, we're not a leader today. We're not respected anymore. We're not um, looked up to anymore like we had been in the past. We have leadership that's not leading us in the right direction. And it's all coming down pretty close to the end pretty soon. Amen. And I think we all realize that. But Gentile nations, United States, England, France, it doesn't matter what Gentile nation you're talking about. God has allowed them to have power in a sense in certain times, even back in the Old Testament times, because of the fact Israel rebelled against God and was rejecting God. She has not accepted Jesus Christ as her Messiah yet. Therefore, the Gentile nations have experienced power. Um, God allowed a lot of times sinful kings to come in there and destroy Judah. And we talked about that before. We talked about the Nebuchadnezzar. Um, you know, and talks about, and that's when exactly when the times of the Gentiles began. Luke 21, 24 talks about that. Jesus mentioned it. If we turn over to Luke 21, 24, Jesus mentioned about the times of the Gentiles. Well, when is the times of the Gentiles? When are they going to end? It began when Nebuchadnezzar came in and, and um, destroyed, captured Judah and destroyed Jerusalem. That's when the times of the Gentiles began. When is it going to end? When Jesus comes back. Amen. So 21 and 24 says this. Jesus said. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. And shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Israel has been trodden down by Nebuchadnezzar. You think about it. Haman tried to kill him. Hitler tried to kill him. You know. Herod tried to kill baby Jesus and killed a lot of the baby boys so they have been trodden down by the Gentile nations for a long time but even though Israel has not been in the will of God for thousands of years I think when we studied about Israel here the past few months I think we can realize and understand that they have contributed a lot to the world the medical breakthroughs the technology the inventions that they have given to us probably more than any other nation in the world except maybe the United States. We have a lot of inventions. I know there are a lot of inventions came from Germany as well. But when you look at what Israel has done in the past and then what they're still doing even today to, um, to bring forth inventions and, and different medical breakthroughs especially, uh, it's an amazing thing. You know, as a contrast to the Jewish people, when you look at the Muslims, for instance, instead of contributing to society, the Muslims contribute murder and death and starvation and, and uh, slavery and just uh, fear and superstition. You know, they, they consider the United States as being the great Satan. That's what they call us. They consider Israel as being the little Satan. And that's why they are so bent and so adamant about just trying to destroy Israel and trying to destroy the United States. And anybody who does not believe the way they believe is called an infidel. And they're out to kill the infidel. And they will do anything they can. So my, my question is, if that's the case, and the United States knows this, then why are we spending billions of dollars to help them survive? You know, a lot of that comes down to the point that we do not vote in the right people in our administration. And I'm going to tell you, the church has a lot to do with that. This didn't just happen five weeks ago or six months ago or a year and a half ago. We've been dealing with this for a long time. 
And if the church had been doing their part years back, we would have been putting the right people in the administration. Listen, we've got some people up there in Congress that have been there forever, close to 100 years old. Well, 80, that's close enough. <laughs> you look at the ones, 80-something years old, and they're making the rule, the law for us, and it's just like they've lost their mind. Well, they got voted in 50 and 60 years ago. Where was the church back then? We didn't pay attention to what was going on. This is exactly where we were. And because we didn't pay attention to what was going on and because we did not pray about who to go vote for, and I can tell you right now, a lot of church people didn't even vote. I know for a fact. People, a lot of times in churches back then, I'll say, well, God will take care of it. God will handle it. We don't have to go vote. God will just put the right person in there. You no, know, God allowed the person to get in there to show the church something and shows that we're going to have to repent. Amen? Just like he was judging Israel for what they did when they rebelled against him. God has allowed this to happen to the United States. But we should have been voting the right people in a long time ago. And because we were not voting the right people in, now we're paying, paying the price now. And we will continue to pray. <clears throat> God knows all things and he's in control of things and he'll ha handle it. But we could have avoided a lot of this if we'd have put the right people in there to begin with. Amen? <clears throat> the Muslims also... Are, it's not just the Muslims, I should say, but a lot of other people that are <clears throat> not Muslim, they're just plain evil unbelievers. They accept abortions, same-sex marriage, homosexuality, homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism, and other lifestyles. These are abominations to God. Thankfully, the Supreme Court this past Friday passed the law where they overturned Roe versus Wade, and that's good. But the, I'm going to tell you something. You think it's all over with now and it's going to be quiet? The battle has just begun. Now it's going to be every state's going to have to deal with it. There again, the Christians had better stand up for it. Right now in Texas, we're doing pretty good. And we've got government that is completely against abortion. But let me tell you, those people that are against abortion right now are not going to be in office forever. There's going to come a time when their term is going to be up. And we're going to have to start voting for people to put the right people in there to keep it to where abortion is not acceptable in our state. But we need to be praying as Christians, praying for our nation, for these other states to be able to, to put the right people in there because if you don't put the right people in those states, you're going to have abortions again. You continue on. It's not just abortions. It's the different lifestyles. Different lifestyles. So you see how important it is? You know, I used to, we used to say that, that you had to separate religion uh, from politics and separate church and state. Constitution talks about separation of church and state, but it's not the way a lot of people think. It did not mean that you're supposed to separate politics and um, the church and state and just don't go just don't go vote. That's not what it meant at all. You were supposed to go out there and vote in order to have freedom. And if you don't vote then don't start complaining about what the, const what the Congress is doing and what the administration is doing. You have no reason to complain. You, have no, you, have, you, don't, have a, you don't have any say-so. But what the Constitution says, everybody has a right to vote, and that's our responsibility. You don't keep freedom unless you keep voting for freedom. If you don't vote for freedom, you're going to be enslaved. And I can name off different countries right now who have gone through that. They didn't vote for freedom, and they're enslaved today by the Muslims and by other people. And the United States of America is not any different. We're not so special that we won't have the same thing happen here if we're not careful. So we're just gonna, I'm just trying to encourage you, when the time comes to vote, you need to get out there and vote. You don't know how to vote? Come to me, and I'll tell you how to do it. I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm just telling you how to go in there and punch the button or whatever. <laughs> okay? It's not hard. And I'll be real honest with you, for a long time, I didn't vote either. I've learned my lesson. When I was young, 25, 30 years old, I said, oh, well, you know, my vote won't count. I hear that all the time. Yeah, my vote won't count. But if you get millions of people who say, my vote won't count, I won't go, that's how the other side gets hold of everything. And I've learned late in life that you have to go and stand up for what you believe and you have to vote for it. Because if you don't and the wrong thing comes along, you have no say-so over it. And you shouldn't complain about it. And you lose your freedom as well. So we talked about how 
Joel prophesied about the former rain, the former rain that was given in moderation, but the latter rain would come in the first month. The rain he's talking about is, a out, is a symbolic of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The former rain, it, it actually began with the early church. And let me tell you, within 100 years, it was already beginning to go to apostatize. The church was beginning to apostatize already within 100 years' time. They didn't even last 100 years, and it was already beginning to turn away from God. A little by little by little. They began to lose their zeal. They began to lose the leading of the Holy Spirit. And over a time, the Catholic system, which is called, Catholic means universal, uh, that system eventually took hold and led into the Dark Ages. And that's what we had up until about 1517 when Martin Luther came. And after he read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, he realized that we just live by faith. Amen. And so he began to, to preach that. And he was put out of the Lutheran church. But at least we know that that's when it, that started the Reformation. But the early rain and the former rain, the former rain in Israel occurs in October. And this is what you need to understand, the difference between why the former rain and latter rain, why it's so important. The former rain, in the physical sense, occurs in October in Israel. In the spiritual sense, the former rain occurred during the early church after Jesus was crucified and the early church began, Peter and Paul and the disciples and such as that. That former rain in the natural is meant to germinate that seed, make the seed grow when it's in the ground. It's not going to grow without rain. So it makes that seed grow and come forth. In the spiritual sense, that former rain when the Holy Spirit came down the day of Pentecost and 3,000 were, were filled with the Holy Spirit, it it germinated, in other words, it began that church and it, the, with the Holy Spirit. It began that church to grow with the Holy Spirit there, and that's what caused that church to grow. And they had persecution that you would not believe. But because they had persecution there in Jerusalem, they started spreading out, and they went to all other areas of the world. And they, to Rome, I mean, to, uh, to Europe, and up toward Russia and places like that. And then from Europe, it came to the United States over a long period of time. That's the former rain. So you have to have the former rain to get things started, whether it's a, a plant in the ground or whether it's a church or whether it's a revival, what it's going to be. You have to have that former rain. The latter rain in Israel occurs in April. The latter rain is what you have right before you have the harvest. What does that do? It makes the, the plants grow a lot more so they can be ready for a really good harvest. Okay. That's in the physical sense. In the spiritual sense, the latter rain began around the 20th century. And we still have it somewhat, not as much as we should. And, I, and Brother Roger preached a really good message Sunday morning on the revival. It was a great message. But the latter rain in the spiritual means you have to have that to get people ready for the harvest. What is the harvest? The rapture. So you see, you compare symbolically that physical former rain and latter rain to the spiritual former rain and latter rain and which is the Holy Spirit and we have to have that in order to be ready for the rapture when the rapture takes place amen so <clears throat> Ephesians 5 27 tells us Jesus will be coming for a glorious church he said a glorious church without spot or wrinkle amen and Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, the gospel must be preached in all the world before he returns. Let's turn to that and see. Matthew 24, 14. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come has to be preached in all nations. Then shall the end come. Okay, back to Joel, verse 24. It says, And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. The verse speaks of the harvest of prosperity. It said the floors are going to be full of wheat, and the vats are going to overflow with wine and oil. And it's going to take place during the coming kingdom age where there will be an abundance of food. In the spiritual sense, though, in the spiritual sense, the wheat speaks of the harvest of souls. 
the wine speaks of the great joy, and the oil is referring to the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus talked about, look out there and see the fields are white into harvest. He's talking about that means right before you go harvest that wheat, when the, for, the latter rain has come, the wheat is ready to be harvested. It has a white tops on there. And he said the, the fields are ready to harvest. Amen. So the wine speaks of great joy. The oil is referring to the Holy Spirit. It always does in the scriptures. So interesting, the word they use for wheat, I thought this was really great. It indicates pure grain. It's separated from the husk or the chaff and straw. So it is speaking of wheat, the harvest of souls, that has been thoroughly purged of all chaff and therefore clean. And I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 3, because spiritually speaking, this is what John was talking about when he was preaching before, when he was preaching as the forerunner to Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So when you look at the words that, that they use for the word wheat, in the verse in Joel and see that it's talking about the harvest of souls and it's talking about wheat that has been completely cleaned of all the chaff and all the impurities. It's a pure wheat. That's what they harvest. They harvest that pure wheat in order for it to be a good harvest. Jesus is saying the same thing. He'll be coming back for a church that's pure without spot or wrinkle. And he'll be, um, be coming back to accept that church. In Luke 21, 28, he told us to lift up, his, uh, lift up our heads for his redemption draweth nigh. Amen. Okay, verse 25. It says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Joel mentions this again in verse 25. He's mentioned it about three times already in his, so far. And said that the time that the, these insects destroyed the, the uh, harvest, that time will be restored. And what he's talking about is God's people will repent and turn to him. And that area of Israel, the harvest of souls, area of Israel will be restored. In other words, in the physical, he said it would be restored. The land would be restored. But in the spiritual sense, he's talking about there's always going to be a remnant, and he's going to restore his nation of Israel. Why? Because they are going to be the premier nation again. They were supposed to be that all along, and they were supposed to be preaching the word of God, but they were not. But they will be great witnesses when that time comes. The Lord will restore to them the things they have lost. It's been over 2,500 years that people have, have lost out on things because of their rebellion, but when they repent, it says the Lord will restore to them all the things they have lost. His great army is referring to the great empires of the nations, the Gentile nations, the ones that God allowed to rule Israel for 2,500 years. You know, God has allowed Israel to be ruled by the Gentiles for over 2,500 years. And before that, he was, they were ruled by the Gentiles as well. But we need to keep remembering the reason that God is doing that is waiting for the, for the Jews to come back is because he's trying to get them to repent. The only reason that God has taken the time and the effort to send judgment and discipline upon Israel is because he's trying to get them to repent of their sins of rejection and rebellion. And when they do it, things will be restored to them. They'll have salvation. We'll have a perfect peace. We'll have prosperity in the nations and in the world. But he's waiting for that to happen. He controls the spiritual things. The great army is referring to the terrible Antichrist that will be allowed to control the Jewish people and murder many of them before they turn to him in repentance and ask forgiveness. Even though God deals with nations, he deals with individuals as well. And I think we can look at that when the church and understand that it's not just Israel he's talking about, but I feel like he's talking to the, the church, 
to individuals, to believers in the church, that we need to be ready and we need to, to, um, to focus upon him. And he will restore to us what we've lost. You know, a good example is Job, for instance. Job lost a lot. But when Job, and Job was a righteous man, but when, when God was through allowing Satan to deal with Job, God restored to him, and he had more than he ever had before. He lost it. Amen? So it's an amazing thing. Luke 11.10 said that Jesus said, Everyone who seeks him will find him, and that's all because of the cross. Okay, and then in conclusion, verses 26 and 27 says this, And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. It's interesting that God is always saying, you shall know that I am the Lord your God. I am the one. In other words, he's wanting to be praised for that. So in the coming kingdom age, Israel is promised that she will be able to eat in plenty and be satisfied and should never be ashamed. And she has been ashamed for so many years. She'll have an abundance of God's blessings on her and she will be able to be where she needs to be. And I said a while ago that I believe the church needs to take heed to this and we do not teach replacement theology. We're not teaching that where the church takes the place of Israel. But I do believe that God's telling the believers that they can be blessed the same way and that they will, they will have prosperity. And uh, we do teach that when a person accepts the Lord as Savior, then that person immediately becomes a child of God and is therefore subject to receive every blessing. Interesting, though, when you become a child of God, you're there to receive every single blessing that God has for you. Amen? But you're also going to be apt to receive some discipline if he wants to do that to you. <laughs> and people don't teach that and preach that. But you know, if we go by the wayside a little bit, God will bless, will, he will, he, even though he's blessing us, he will still discipline us at times. And we'll do that. So uh, God wants to bless his children more than we want to be blessed, I believe. But uh, we realize that when we're called a child of God, we're able to receive all of that. So it says, even though God sometimes has to chastise his children, his love toward us is what? Everlasting. As long as we maintain our faith in Jesus Christ on the cross. Our proper faith in Jesus and his sacrificial atonement is the only requirement that we must meet. And because of this, I believe God looks at us through the eyes of Jesus. We've been cleansed by his blood, saved because of what he did for us, because of faith that he gives us through the cross. Amen. Israel's going to one day realize the magnitude of what all has happened and about the atonement and she'll realize what Jesus has done for her. And a lot of people are sitting in churches today probably don't thoroughly realize. We don't understand it so it's hard to realize it sometimes. But we need to have by faith and believe that God is blessing. Does anybody have any questions or comments? All right. We, we will continue with this next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, and we'll be starting with verse 28 in chapter 2, and then we'll go on and see how far we get. <laughs> but um, just if you can, uh, if you'd like to, for the ones that are on social media, if you would like to have a copy of the outline ahead of time, you can um, let us know, call on the number that's on the bottom of the screen there, or email us and let us know. We'd be glad to send you a copy, uh, email it to you free of charge. Amen. All right, let's bow our heads and we'll be dismissed in prayer tonight. Lord, we're thanking you t so much for your word tonight and for your blessings to us. And we know, Lord, that you're able to bless those who are repentant, Lord, and you're able to, to continue to protect and keep those who are willing to work for you and to do what you would have us to do. We're thanking you tonight, Lord Jesus, for your word. We're thanking you, Lord, for all the things that you've done for us. And now as we are dismissed from this service, we ask that you would protect each and every one on their way home. Protect us, Lord, until we meet again Sunday morning. And be with us, we pray. And we ask these things.